Today in this episode of Brain Pondering, it's my pleasure to chat with Professor Carl Friskin, Friskin of UCL, University College London, where he's a scientific director at the Wellcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging. And he's also a lead scientist in the Human Brain Project, which is a, a big uh, effort to, to try to understand the brain, how it's organized structurally and the functional relationships between different brain regions and their relation to behaviors and, and disease, which Professor Friston is also interested in. Uh, his uh, bachelor's work at Cambridge was in physics and psychology, and that kind of frames his whole career. If, when I looked at his publications and what he's done, he's kind of combined a mentality of physics with neuroscience, and I think it's led to some really fascinating findings, which I look forward to talking with him about. So Carl, why don't you go back to some of your earliest research, which, um, uh, well, yeah. So there's been technical advances over actually quite a few decades now that have enabled investigators to get a window into the functioning of the human brain and non-invasively. And your early work uh, was with uh, Richard Frakowiak at, at the MRC cyclotron unit. And you, you can explain what a cyclotron is and why that's important for your early work. <laughs> I can't, I've forgotten all my physics. I can't explain how a cyclotron works. No, no. <laughs> I'll do, I'll do my best to, to explain what we need to know for the purposes of this uh, okay. conversation. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That, that, you know, there, there have been tremendous advances in the past 20, 30 years um, in terms of looking inside our skulls and trying to work out the, you know, the functional architectures of, uh, of, of the brain. Uh, and in the UK, uh, and certainly for me, um, that sort of uh, turning point was in the late 80s, early 90s by um, pioneers like uh, Terry Jones and Richard Fikoviak and all their colleagues um, at the MRC Cyclotron unit. So this was the, in the, in the UK at least, the inception of modern human brain mapping as we know it. It relied upon measuring blood flow, you know, the responses of neuronal activation as reported by changes in cerebral perfusion, literally sort of turning on the taps in a local way um, in the brain to supply the neuronal architecture with sufficient metabolites and oxygen um, through increasing the blood flow. But to measure blood flow, um, you had to inject or inhale radioactive traces. Uh, and these radioactive traces uh, clearly had to decay sufficiently fast not to offer a danger to um, the subjects that we were imaging, um, which created a particular problem. You had to create the radioactivity on site, which required a cyclotron. So you had to have you know, the kit to generate and thereby label radioactively traces that could then we used both injection and in inhalation um, to be able to image by using positron emission tomography the concentration of radio labeled blood and its fluctuations with different brain states. Um, an interesting little story here is that you know, the half-life of these um, radio traces were in the order of you know, a minute or so. Mm -hmm. So we used to fondly vent the radioactivity for, after inhaling from the subjects. Uh, to what we thought was a benign place, but it turned out to be a school playing field next door to the cyclotron <laughs> unit. But I'm sure no harm was done. Uh, but they were, they were pioneering days, uh, getting very crude images of, of blood flow that allowed you to compare the pattern of cerebral uh, perfusion in different brain states. Say, for example, a very famous early ex example was looking at some black and white pictures versus color pictures and identifying the, the okay. color area in the brain or more sophisticated um, paradigms, asking people just to repeat words that began with the same letter versus generating um, exemplars of particular categories sort of invoking internal generation of, 
thoughts and semantics and uh, you know, the other kind of operations that we'd associate with verbal, verbal fluency. So those are exciting and early days. Uh, and you probably know, as well as I do, the story since that time, the advent of functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a, a much simpler way of, of measuring um, fluctuations in uh, blood oxygenation, um, you know, using, uh, using the intrinsic magnetic properties of, of hemoglobin as opposed to having to use radio traces. Yeah, and it's, it's well established that there's a pretty much a direct relationship between the amount of activity in the neuronal circuits in a particular brain region and the amount of blood flow to that brain region. So by measuring the blood flow, it's an indirect measure of the activity of the neurons. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think Bob Turner once described this as some watering the, the flower bed to let the, you know, to let, let the plants grow at a, a very fast time scale. The, there were other uh, theories which uh, are not um, in retrospect so silly that uh, uh, another um, purpose of this increased blushing of the brain was to sort of remove the excess heat produced by neural metabolism. So, you know, diff different explanations for, for this uh, fortuitous association between cerebral perfusion and blood flow and neural activity, which of course is what we wanted to understand. But it's generally similar to any tissue, like your skeletal muscles, when you're exercised, there's increased blood flow to them because they need more oxygen, they need more energy, glucose, for example, and it's the same in the brain. Absolutely. One, um, I've done a lot of work that's relevant to Alzheimer's disease and one radio labeled um, molecule that was used for PET imaging, as you well know, was a radioactive form of glucose, 2-deoxyglucose. And in that case, it's you're kind of more, more getting a little closer to more directly measuring the energy utilization. Now, what, what were some of your earliest findings with PET imaging? You mentioned like having the subjects do some simple or black and white versus color or uh, what other kinds of discoveries did you make concerning particular brain regions and the relation to some cognitive function? Right, yeah, that's a great question. Probably best answered by um, the principles that emerged from that early work. And perhaps, um, <clears throat> probably not so much discoveries, but confirmation of hypotheses that, you know, that were in the air and enjoyed a legacy of your know, centuries work of careful neuropsychology and neuroanatomy. And one of the key hypotheses was the notion of functional specialization and particular functional segregation, the notion that particular brain areas had a specialized function and that specialization was segregated. So that, you know, for example, the, the poster child of this uh, kind of notion was functional specialization for color vision. The idea that there were segregated neuronal populations, particular parts of the visual hierarchy that was specialized for processing wavelength selective responses to engender the percept of color. Now, this was a hypothesis in the sense that no one had ever measured that part of the brain and the other part or everything else in the brain to be able to say, yes, this part of the brain activated and everywhere else didn't activate to actually tie down the, uh, the notion of this functional segregation. So for the very first time in the history of systems neuroscience, we were able to envisage, measure, look at this principle in action, actually see a little part of the brain activate when you saw color relative to when you saw the same kind of picture, but was in uh, your know, monochromatic uh, format or in black and white. So that principle was, was remarkable, you know, just to be able to demonstrate the modular, factorized, structured, segregated specialization of the brain for different levels of processing and different levels of sense making. Um, the, you know, the accompanying principles that emerged over the ensuing years um, led to the next set of questions, which was the, pr the principle of functional integration. So in one sense, the early um, initiatives in brain mapping were a kind of cartography, a kind of map making. And indeed, you know, we were accused of 
being neophrenologists, you're finding little bumps here and there, understanding people's brains in terms of these uh, this sort of new cartography or new phrenology. Um, but it be quickly became obvious that one of the um, one of the key challenges was to understand the coordination, the integration of this distributed but specialized processing. So how did one part of the brain talk to another part of the brain? Uh, and within a few years, people were starting to look at patterns of correlations, the influence and activity in one part of the brain exerted over responses in another to try and get at the, the effective connectivity, what we nowadays known as the connectome uh, at a certain scale. So, in summary, that were, those early days were, were days of map making and exploration, setting the points of reference and nodes in a distributed graph of um, a fun that defined a functional architecture that then slowly turned its attention to the message passing and the edges on that graph that were responsible for the, the sense making and the coordination integration of that distributed processing. And, and, and prior to that point, a lot of the data was based on, on animal studies, and but also on human case studies, essentially, where people had brain damage that was selective per, to a particular region, and that person had some deficit. So kind of the conclusion is, um, and yeah, and the, the interesting thing there, you mentioned the color versus black and white. So most of our viewers will know, know that there are rods and cones in your retina. And the cones are sensitive to color, but the rods aren't. So essentially what you were finding is there's kind of a, a maintenance of this map going all the way from the retina in the certain regions at the back of the brain. Yeah, that's yeah, fascinating. And um, so then when, when did you get start working? As soon as fMRI, functional magnetic resonancing imaging came on board, you started, you kind of switched from PET to fMRI, is that right? Yes, I, I think a lot of people did, a lot of people who were, uh... Um, pioneers in trying to get these sort of broad brush macroscopic descriptions of functional architectures um, sort of tied down. So people were, were, I repeat, sort of invested in getting the, uh, you know, the, the maps in place to start to understand you know, in more and more fine grained detail the, the kind of functional specialization uh, that people had hypothesized exactly as you say through single case studies of brain damaged pe people sort of using using the lesion deficit model you know a century of careful neuropsychology in combination um, with animal studies you know dating back to people like uh, David Ferrier and Colts and the like so all of these ideas were there but it was there now uh, you know uh, realizing these hypotheses and uh, taking them in a much more fine-grained way forward um, by using anything that one could use effectively to get at, at the selective activation of different brain areas. So certainly functional magnetic resonance imaging, which came along within you know, two, three, four years, was really useful because you didn't need a cyclotron anymore. You could actually just use the intrinsic properties of magnetized uh, blood that uh, had differential behaviors and uh, emitted different sort of uh, uh, um, detectable radio waves, um, depending upon whether it's oxygenated or not. So that meant that these things were much easier. Um, I mean, there were lots of problems to be solved, like movement artifacts and the like, and you know, an enormous amount of physics, uh, medical physics, um, was, was underneath the hood. But from the point of view of the empirical neuroscientists, this was a great opportunity now to, instead of acquiring, say, 12 PET images of cerebral blood flow based upon radio labeled oxygen, you could now acquire hundreds, if not thousands, of sequential images of the brain every few seconds or so. And you know, so this, this was a real, uh, a real boon. Um, from our, my point of view, it really meant repurposing the um, effectively 
the generation of statistical x-rays, you know, so x-rays that were reporting the significance of, a, of an activation based upon, you know, 12 time series now to, uh, you know, hundreds of time series, and, you know, thinking very carefully about the neurovascular coupling, the sort of link between neuronal activity, neural responses elicited by stimuli or by different attentional sets or different brain states, and the ensuing changes in blood flow and oxygenation of the blood, which were quite slow processes from the point of view of the brain. So from the point of view of the brain, it's passing messages around them you know, every uh, few milliseconds, or at least fluctuating signals over hundreds of milliseconds. And yet the underlying or the thing that we could measure was this rather slow, sluggish, turning on all of the taps, which were then followed over you know, four to eight seconds. Um, so all that had to be carefully modeled. Technically, uh, we had to undo the smoothing or the convolution that the hemodynamics, the dynamics of the blood flow applied to the neural activity to get back at the neural activity. So there's a lot of development work there in terms of the analysis tools that created things like statistical parametric mapping, the sort of these statistical x-rays of brain activity or excitement um, as a function of you know, brain states induced by stimuli, by asking subjects to do this or that, or um, uh, you know, um, requiring them to attend in different ways to different aspects of their sensorium. So a, a whole explosion of different sort of brain mapping studies all getting at different aspects of either functional specialization or functional integration. And until tell your until your your work, which where you essentially develop the statistical parametric mapping analysis of these functional MRI images, people would have these beautiful images of the brain, right? And they'd show kind of a relative change under a different condition. And but there wasn't really robust quantification and, and the ability to, as you mentioned, do a time series within the same individual's brain look over time or compare between individuals, which is also you know, a big problem. So for example, if you have someone with early stages of Alzheimer's disease versus someone without, um, you know, initial study, they have to do a lot of a lot of people and make sure your statistical analyses are robust. And you made really important contribution to the field in that regard. And I think in my reading of, of your background, that's why one of the main reasons you were elected a fellow of the Royal Society. And then for the American listeners or others who don't know, the Royal Society is uh, being a member of that is kind of equivalent of being a member of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. Um, and the other thing you developed was what's called voxel-based morphometry. So everybody knows what a pixel is. It's kind of a two-dimensional square on our computer screens. A voxel is a cube three-dimensional. Could you talk a little bit about voxel-based morphometry? Yes, of course. Yeah, that, that's all right. So yes, it's voxel is just shorthand for a, vox, a, a volume element as opposed to a pixel, which is a picture element, but they're the same sort of constructs from, yeah. from my point of view. Yeah, so voxel-based morphometry was a, you know, a very interesting, um, if you like, repurposing of this uh, notion of creating statistical maps or uh, statistical uh, parametric mapping, but deployed not to look at fluctuations in brain activity in sequences or time series of brain images, but to compare the structural um, images, usually from magnetic resonance imaging from one set of subjects to another set of subjects, occasionally looking at longitudinal sub, uh, studies, but usually comparing the, you know, a sample of these kinds of people with samples from a cohort, say with people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and of course the information contained within these anatomical images pertained more to 
cortical thickness or the volume of certain subcortical structures, the composition of the neuropil, the things that might be um, affected by neurodegenerative processes at a macroscopic level to which that, that kind of MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, was tuned. So the question, of course, from the point of view of the data analysis was exactly the same. Is there evidence for any significant difference between the signals in this part of the brain or in this voxel relative to this set of subjects? It was just repurposing exactly the same um, mathematical techniques. Um, incidentally, uh, those techniques uh, were really fascinating uh, in the sense of you know, taking standard statistics and saying, well, what would you have to do to protect yourself from false positives, things like type one, type two areas, when the data you have at hand is not just one measurement, say reaction time or concentration, but was a spatially extended field. And that took us into random field theory and a lot of beautiful mathematics to try and uh, get at a kind of inference that worked for topo topological features in extended fields. So that that's that, that that's the you know the, the you know, we spent many many years trying try, trying to sort of um, establish and validate that that approach, and then deploy that approach to ask to asking questions about differences in the anatomical composition and size of various brain structures or. Um, the uh, the contribution of gray matter that contained all the neurons relative to say white matter or cerebral uh, the CSF spaces cerebral spinal fluid spaces that change characteristically in different parts of the brain um, in certain conditions you know neuro, you know, neurogenitive conditions things things like Alzheimer so voxel based morphometry was just the, you know inherited from exactly the same maths that was developed to um, analyze those original PET scans that itself was then developed to analyze the, the functional magnetic resonance imaging. And that VBM, um, voxel-based morphometry, that's proved a really simple but really useful workhorse since, you know, since its inception. People are still writing VBM papers and trying to target the, uh, you know, or sometimes nuanced in terms of lesion deficit mapping or, um, uh, you know, applied to, you um, newer kinds of um, MRI uh, images that, that are sensitive to the direction of, say, fibers, diffusion-weighted imaging. But the underlying idea uh, you know, has remained firmly in place as a very useful tool to, again, another kind of window on the, on the brain, but in this instance, an anatomical, structural kind of uh, um, window. Yeah. And then, um... Before we, uh, we'll talk about schizophrenia a little bit, but before, we, because you have an, you've had a long-standing interest in that disorder. Um, but you, what, what were some of your findings with your early studies of functional MRI, the kind of new contributions to understanding the, um, I guess the, the functional segregation, which you talked about and, and integration between brain regions, because certainly most of our behaviors, we require a lot of integration. You know, initially, some, maybe something come, uh, images coming through our eyes, sounds through our ears, or even internally generated thoughts. And then a lot of the processing has to do with leading to some action or inaction. You know, take, taking some, making a decision, doing something or not. Um, so, uh, I mean, I said a lot there, right? <laughs> Can you get, just kind of talk about your insights to that? Because that's really what kind of the gist, gist of your work is trying to get at. No, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you, you did cover an enormous amount there. And of course, any answer to your question, a proper yeah. answer would, would take would take many hours. So, you know, every aspect of brain function that you can um, imagine at this sort of systemic or systems level uh, of analysis has been um, um, progressed using brain imaging. 
Um, I think you sort of nicely distinguish between sort of two broad classes of questions one might ask of how does the brain work. One is the sense making, you know, how do we make sense of our sensory inputs? Uh, how do we construct the right kind of explanations for what's going out on out there outside of our skulls? So what is the what are the mechanics and what are the pr principles of the message passing among these functionally specialized neural populations that gives rise to uh, an understanding or sense making in terms of a representation of the causes that, that, you know, of our sensations. And then the second kind of uh, uh, process, um, which is to use that sense making, that um, inference about states of affairs out there in the world uh, to decide what to do next. You know, that underlies our decision behavior, um, elemental decisions like, you know, where to look next, right through to choosing who to vote for. You know, all of these things basically are resolutions to the question I have to pose myself or my brain has to pose to itself. What do I do next? And of course, to know what to do next, you need to know the kind of things that you do and the kind of outcomes you prefer, but also the context in which you're operating, which brings us back to the sense making part. So you're absolutely right. There are hundreds of things, hundreds of things we can talk about, ranging um, on the sense making side from um, the, the nature of the architectures that um, are in an embodiment of how we think our sensations are caused. And one key principle that emerged was the, was the notion of a hierarchical architecture. So for example, the visual hierarchy. And once you understand that in terms of um, hierarchical message passing, then you can start talking about the role, the distinctive role of bottom up messages from, from the retina through to the visual cord via the lateral geniculate nucleus and then up the visual hierarchy from V1 to V2 and V3. And then the reverse flow, the recurrent, the reciprocal descending top down effects. What are they doing? How can we understand uh, the role of these descending, um, um, this counter stream of, of messages and how does it contextualize processing of the stimuli uh, that are ascending the hierarchy? Different kinds of um, hierarchical construals emerged in, in the context of um, the, uh, the patterns of correlations that one saw, which spoke to the sort of large scale organization in terms of intrinsic brain networks, intrinsic brain networks, things like the default mode and or the salience network or dorsal attention network. Again, sort of millennial kind of reworkings or relabelings of the, the, you know, the functional anatomy that it inherited from centuries or a century of neuropsychology. Uh, but even within these um, uh, sort of global intrinsic brain networks, there was hierarchical structure. You know, you know, what was deep in the hierarchy? What kind of processes, uh, you know, for example, um, those parts of the prefrontal cortex um, involved in the default mode network, you know, were they particularly involved in perspective taking and theory of mind, um, sort of introspection and how did that distinguish uh, itself from um, a, a greater focus on what's going on, on, a, you know, on out there in terms of sense making and extraception, um, interoception in the anterior insula. Then moving to um, broad themes in decision making, um, you know, clear applications here were, were to understand the nature of planning, the nature of choice behavior, the role of um, um, putative um, neuromodulated transmitter systems like dopamine and you know, how could one infer their roles, for example, either in Parkinson's disease where there was a poverty movement or in terms of um, reward learning and dopamine as a prediction error signal. So you know, everywhere you look, so people were using brain imaging to answer their favorite questions. But interesting, as you say, sort of, you know, one set of people thinking about perception and perceptual synthesis. And, um, you know, how did we understand the brain as an organ that made sense of data? Very much in the same way that we were trying to make sense of all this brain imaging data, you know, trying to organize to make sense of it. How does the brain do that?
Um, and then on the other hand, how do we understand all the mechanics of decision making and planning and action selection and eventually either motor execution or indeed in some studies, um, the, the kind of interceptive actions that would associate with homeostasis autonomic control. I think this is a you know you mentioned prefrontal cortex and you mentioned dopamine and um, why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about schizophrenia? I I haven't had a podcast per se on schizophrenia, and I don't think I have one scheduled. So maybe if you could talk about that and um, yeah, because it, it's really intriguing, right? These internally generated hallucinations and so on and and what explains that and I recently did have a podcast with Franz Vollenweider I don't know if you oh, come yes. across yes. him but yes and no, I know well yeah 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 and you know so he, yeah because he's doing a lot of imaging with the psychedelics right and you know there's this very interesting relationship in terms of uh signaling pathways in the brain between you know what's going wrong in schizophrenia and the mechanism of action of these psychedelics yeah no absolutely um and in many respects you know psychedelics um could be seen as you know useful tools to understand the disintegration of sense making uh, and it's you know it's um what it must be like to lose contact with the sort of deep constructs that we make or explanations or stories we tell ourselves to explain our sensations. So, you know, there are some very deep connections there. And also um, this, you know, the take uh, on the, the pathophysiology of schizophrenia um, that, are, uh, that we have pursued actually comes from those very early PET studies. So just for your entertainment, I got into this game because of schizophrenia research. So I was a psychiatrist before um, coming back to sort of uh, the, the more physics-y part of uh, my, my, my passions. Um, and so all of the um, statistical parametric mapping and subsequent analyses in terms of voxel based morphometry and things like dynamic causal modeling, which was a, um, a way of trying to address this question of functional integration, they were all devised in order to analyze PET scans and fMRI scans from people with schizophrenia mm -hmm. with my colleagues, people like Peter Liddell and, and Chris Frith. Um, mm -hmm. So all of this, all this, these sort of te this technology actually was inspired by schizophrenia research. The one thing that came out um, in the very early studies and has stood the test of time is uh, the notion of schizophrenia as a disconnection syndrome, as a uh, an expression of a dysfunctional integration, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a dysfunction of connectivity, a failure of coordination, uh, and that was very evident in the patterns of responses of people with and without schizophrenia to changes in um, their uh, brain activity. Um, during things like verbal fluency paradigms. And what we saw was a very unusual pattern of coordination between temporal and frontal activations that was um, pathognomonic of schizophrenia. And that led to this notion of schizophrenia as a, a disconnection um, uh, syndrome or the disconnection hypothesis. Over the years, though, um, that has that view of uh, schizophrenia as literally you know, a, a discoordination or disintegration of uh, coordinated activity has been refined um, by insights into the nature of sense making in the brain um, and currently is really construed in terms of um, a particular kind of uh, disconnection that rests upon a failure of integration at the level of synapses of the so we're talking really about a, you know, a synaptopathy that is expressed um, in terms of a failure of message passing between different brain, brain regions. Um, and more specifically, um, the, the synaptopathies 
that people have in mind here are those where there's a loss of the control of the excitability of different populations in, uh, to their presynaptic inputs. So often cast in terms of a, a failure of cortical gain control or a failure of excitation inhibition balance, noting that psychedelics and all the drugs that work in schizophrenia are precisely those kinds of drugs that affect the setting of the excitability through neuromodulatory uh, effects, either through classical neuromodulatory receptor agonism or antagonism, <coughs> excuse me, through to altering um, interactions between um, fast spiking inhibitory interneurons via you know, effects on MDA receptors. Uh, but wherever you look, the end point of all these interventions and all these um, um, uh, therapeutic um, manipulations and possibly the pathophysiology of conditions such as schizophrenia, they all implicate this, uh, this, this uh, delicate balance between excitation inhibition um, or the gain or the responsiveness of certain populations. So if you take that and ask, well, what would that do if I was a sense-making creature? Um, you know, what kinds of things might go wrong if my job or my brain's job was to infer the state of affairs and what I'm going to do next. And I use this, the, the word infer deliberately here because um, if there's an inference problem at hand, then there is also a problem of inferring the uncertainty about the data upon which you're basing your inference. So if you think about vision, for example, or perception in the visual domain, one can construe this as a perceptual process by which you are trying to infer the best explanation for your sensory impressions. You know, is this a face or is this a lamp? Is this a book? Uh, you know, was that a bird? Was it a butterfly? Everything that we, if you like, um, perceive can be thought of as an explanation that best explains our sensory impressions through the rods and cones uh, in the retina that we we're talking about before. If that's the case, then um, this kind of inference requires you not just to measure the data, but also the reliability of the data, the precision of the data, the signal to noise of the data, the standard error, if you're a statistician, um, the precision, basically. Um, and the, the link here is that in certain and schemes such as predictive coding that are thought to be or are considered good candidates for this kind of sense making, this sort of um, predictive inference, um, then um, the encoding of precision is exactly in the excitability of certain populations that are reporting in predictive coding the prediction errors. So we actually come full circle now. We have uh, a notion of schizophrenia that has an explanation in which there is a failure of to modulate the excitability of certain neural populations. We have an idea of the brain as a prediction or a statistical machine, uh, a constructive organ trying to make sense by inferring uh, the causes of its sensations and in so doing, having to set the gain or the excitability of the basis of that um, inference, which is basically the prediction errors. Uh, so if that is true, and you put these two things together, you have this notion of um, somebody who has schizophrenia or somebody who has taken psychedelics are in the very difficult position of making sense of data without having the correct precision assigned to that data. So this would be very much like a statistician computing a t I give you some data from, from say, one of your molecular biology experiments, for example. Uh, and I ask you, is there a difference between this uh, set of data and this set of data here? Um, and you will go in and evaluate a t-statistic, which would be the, the average of this minus the average of this divided by a measurement of the dispersion or the inverse precision, the standard error. But if I 
was a mischievous elf and got into your computer and then divided your standard error by say eight, yeah. you would come up yeah. with, with, with very odd t, t values and the paper you wrote would basically be predicated on false inference. So you can imagine now yeah. the poor brain with its, uh, has a confounded ability to estimate this precision or this standard error coming up with wildly um, off-beam statistics on the basis of uh, on the basis of which it's going to make its inference, making all sorts of type one and type two errors. You know, effectively what we're saying is that one could, uh, could understand schizophrenia as a syndrome where there's a loss of ability to modulate the gain of certain populations that is a syndrome that can be understood in terms of false inference. And by false inference, I mean it literally in the sense of type one and type two errors. For example, a type one error, you know, inferring a positive, uh, uh, a positive, a false positive, inferring something is there when it's not. And of course, that's just a description of a hallucination. Uh, you could also get type two errors in different syndromes, you know, inferring something is not there when it is. And then you have an explanation for things like hemineglect syndromes or dissociative syndromes where, you know, this isn't my arm doc or this side of my, you know, my hemifield doesn't exist doc. You know, the, so more and more when you just, when, when we looked at or when one looks at um, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, through the lens of false inference, you start to see a very clear mapping between the experiences of a patient and when they report their symptoms, uh, uh, um, a, a, a mapping between their experience uh, and the, um, the false inference that would best explain that experience. And of course, now we also have some physiological story that might explain why this this particular kind of false inference um, is so prevalent in conditions like schizophrenia, or indeed, you know, mm -hmm. the visual hallucinosis you can get in. So, you know, if you take too much, uh, too many psychedelics, for example, you know, exactly the same perturbation of our sense making, uh, leading to certainly false, if not uh, so nuanced, if not false, uh, in the you know, in the instance of psychedelics, visual inferences. But if you imagine the same occurring in other domains, false inferences about attribution of agency. Did you cause that? Did I cause that? Is that my thought or is it your thought? What's he doing in my head? You can start to see now what it must be like to, you know, to make sense of the world with a schizophrenic brain. Yeah. Yeah, so it, essentially what you're saying in schizophrenia, there's a decreased signal to noise ratio in terms of uh, of, of uh, in terms of inference and decision making, um, and so I, I did have one technical question with these imaging studies with the patients with schizophrenia. I, I'm assuming are they imaged when they're having a psychotic episode or not? No, the the, the early studies. Um that I, I was referring to there were studies of people with chronic schizophrenia. And of course, there's, there's a, there, oh. there is a reason for that, to, to take somebody who is, you know, acutely psychotic and put them in a, yeah. um, in an MRI or a postural emission tomography scanner is, is not the, you know, the, the, the most um, um, sensible or compassionate thing to do. Um, but the people that we were studying, which were people who had schizophrenia for a long time, were very stable and in fact you know found it a um, uh, an interesting experience to the extent that some of them thought that perhaps they're having the scan might have actually helped some of that some of their symptoms uh, but it was it was uh, it was a very selective cohort um, you know there have been attempts to um, heroic attempts to scan people um, during um, hallucinatory uh, periods um, but of course, you can you can imagine that first of all, knowing exactly when somebody is hallucinating or having a delusional idea is not very easy. You can't just you know you can't get into their heads and and um, and you know mark in time um, their experiences. You know this is very private to to them and their brains. Um, 
that. So most of the most of the imaging work um, has been basically um, in people who are, are, you know have a schizophreniform trait or uh, have had schizophrenia in a particular uh, period of the illness. Some people like to try and focus on um, early onset schizophrenia because, of course. When, you talk, when you're studying people with chronic schizophrenia, they've usually been taking drugs for a long time yeah. and are usually taking drugs at yeah. the point of scanning. And of course, these are exactly the drugs that affect the excitability yeah. and yeah. the coordinated message passing and the, you know, the connectivity that we're trying to assess. So it's a very difficult sort of empirical game, that, um, certainly when you're acting with clinical um, finesse and, and, uh, and sensibility. You know, it's, it's and then, but, but the imaging with psychedelics, the, the subjects are usually imaged, uh, are often anyway, imaged during their trip. Yes, yeah. Uh, and, no, yeah. and so um, what's the comparison of, I guess, brain activity in someone during a psychedelic trip with LSD or psilocybin versus someone with stable schizophrenia? And, and you know, can they be related in any way, meaningful way? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I, one would hope that they could. And indeed, in a, in a sense, that, you know, that, that will be one motivation um, for using um, brain imaging studies of people taking psychedelics as a model for the kind of um, changes in uh, neuromodulatory function that people think underwrite schizophrenia. So, you know, this would be an example. It's, this is not a lesion deficit model in the, in the spirit of, you know, 19th century, 20th century neuropsychology, but it is a sort of pharmacological model in vivo, in humans, um, that is getting quite close now to the kind of synaptic uh, synaptopathy or synaptic disconnections that, that, that people imagine underwrite schizophrenia and possibly other neurodegenerative disorders. And, you know, indeed, you could lump Parkinson's disease as another kind of dopamine or modulation, neuromodulatory related um, synaptopathy and, and disconnection. So um, you know, that's a great example because you can scan people who are experienced users of psychedelics before and after you can measure the uh, the plasma levels of various drugs and you can start to titrate and look at the changes in the message passing and neuronal activation um, on and off the drug and start to sort of look for commonalities in people with schizophrenia. There's lots of wonderful work, you know, so Franz, you've spoken to him, he, you know, he and his students have done some excellent work in, in that area. Um, Robin Carhart Harris is somebody else you probably should be talking to, um, who's you know um, also done some great work um, in this area. Uh, the particular findings I like from those studies um, are characteristic changes in the um, in the excitability of particular populations in specific parts of the brain, and I should say also. It, implicitly at a particular depths in the cortex and you know anatomically the you know uh, the deeper layers of uh, of the cortex or the layer of the of the brain uh, covering the, the white matter um which are exactly what you might posit if you have this notion that you have a visual hierarchy and you're basically perturbing the gain or the excitability differentiate different levels in the hierarchy. So you know, one simple view of this would be um, that I'm going to increase the gain at the bottom of a hierarchy where the visual input is coming in from, from the LGN and the retina and decrease the excitability at the top of the hierarchy or deep in the hierarchy. Mm. So what would that look like? Well, it would basically look like you affording more precision or weight to the data in relation to your prior beliefs about the causes of that data. So that your, uh, your sense making and your perceptual synthesis will be now much more dominated by the elemental features in the data, by the sensory data in and of itself, um, at the expense of uh, providing much more sophisticated, abstracted, um, deeper explanations. So for example, 
instead of saying seeing a wholly formed face, you might now start to literally attend to and perceive all the elements of that face, but not the face as, as a holistic construct or explanation. So you become fascinated with the eyes or the mouth or perhaps the edges or perhaps the texture. Um, so you become preoccupied, unable to attend away from all the low level features and all yes. the pants and the dynamics that, that, that would you yeah. know, normally be used to build up a deep expression oh that's a face let's move on to something else now but no no you're suddenly caught up in the you know, you know the, the sensorial aspects that, that subtend that percept and that's what seems to be reflected in this sort of balance of excitability high in the visual cortex and the parietal cortex for example relative to the excitability of um, lower levels. So that's, I think, one deep connection between the characteristic changes you see in studies of psychedelics and the, uh, the equivalent studies of people uh, with chronic schizophrenia, sort of you know, a, a, an imbalance in the weight assigned to the sensory evidence that underwrites your belief updating and the prior constructs and beliefs that you have or hypotheses that you have that you bring to the table to make sense of that data, sometimes construed in terms of you know, an imbalance between sensory precision and, and, and prior precision. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, as you mentioned, Parkinson was initially thought of a purely dopaminergic disease we now know that that's not true and schizophrenia also early on most of the focus was on dopamine uh, depression anxiety disorders serotonin but but the fact is that the re what's important is where are the receptors for these neurotransmitters and it turns out they're mainly on neurons that use glutamate as their neurotransmitter, glutamatergic neurons. 90% approximately of all neurons in the brain are glutamatergic. They're the excitatory neurons. And the only way any other neurotransmitter affects behavior, you know, thoughts, actions, is by modulating the ongoing activity of these glutamatergic neurons. And in fact, I would say that your imaging studies, you know, you're, you're measuring blood flow, for example, but actually that's, a, that's essentially reporting glutamatergic neuron activity. So in a sense, you're looking at activity in the glutamatergic neurons and then any manipulation you do, you know, something's going on that modifies that activity in a certain way. I think that's a really important point that uh, a lot of times people who are focused on, you know, specific thing, whatever, dopamine, they kind of forget about that important point. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point. I, I'd even push it even further. I, I think that sort of the kind of lumped oxygen dependent or hemodynamic or metabolic sort of response that we measure with things like fMRI it's certainly uh, driven by excitatory glutamatergic um, you know, synaptic activity and message passing, but the fluctuations are probably due to exactly to the modulation you're talking about. That's so you know, we're looking at basically yeah. neuro, the brain just getting that excitability and neuromodulation right, and that's what we're actually seeing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I talked with friends about the the fact that. So in the prefrontal cortex, it's pretty interesting. There's this, uh, one of the deep layers, there are these glutamatergic neurons that have much higher levels of serotonin uh, 2A, 5-HT2A receptors than any other neurons in the brain. And there's other evidence that those glutamatergic, those specific, Glutamatergic neurons are involved in the actions of the psychedelic psychedelics. I don't know if those have been looked at much at all with schizophrenia. Now, this comes to a, a limitation of 
the brain imaging. You, you mentioned the uh, the temporal, the time limitation. You can only you can't get say subsecond information, but also the spatial resolution is what maybe a millimeter cube or something like that, or maybe smaller. I don't know. And and yep. so you're you're actually looking at um, probably hundreds, thousands, thousands maybe of neurons per voxel. I, I would put it at millions, but thousands. Oh, millions at least. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're great points. Um, I, I just to note that you know before I was talking about the um, the action of psilocybin's um, on um, 5H2 receptors, I was thinking specifically about the sort of the, the deep layers in parietal cortex, which would be the sort of the mirror of the deep layers in the prefrontal oh, cortex. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, uh, and probably those two parts of the brain talk to each other quite yeah. a lot, and, and yeah. the talking, of course, um, is uh, mediated certainly by uh, outputs or afferent projections from those deep excitatory, excitatory pyramidal cells that yeah. are um, endowed with these uh, um, receptors that psychedelics target. So there's a, a, a nice point of contact uh, there. But this, just on the technical side, now you're absolutely right. I mean, um, it is said that um, thing, uh, fMRI and MRI has exquisite spatial resolution, but very poor temporal resolution, just because of this sort of blurring the smoothing that we were talking about before due to the metabolics and the hemodynamics. Um, on, uh, in contrast to uh, electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography, EEG and MEG, um, that are, have appalling spatial resolution, but great temporal resolution, you know, getting down to the, to the millisecond. Uh, I think that's largely true if you read exquisite spatial resolution, as you say, as a, as a few millimeters. <laughs> this is, you know, a voxel. Certainly with high field, um, and currently sort of standard high field will be seven Tesla um, MRI, you can get some millimeter voxels. You can get, you know, so sort of a few hundred uh, micron voxels, um, you know, with limited fields of view and, and lots of careful acquisition. So you can get you can get right down to very very fine grained um, uh, voxels, not of the kind you'd find in neuropathology or your know, autoradiography, but but certainly good you know, to look at their beautiful images. The problem is, if you're just looking at activity as reported by um, blood flow or metabolism, um, then the, that spatially blurs the signal. So you're back at sort of two to three millimeters, uh, you know, spatial precision. So you're talking about big chunks of yeah. cortex, hundreds of um, canonical microcircuits, each containing thousands of neurons, yeah. um, which is why I say I'm, you're probably more like a million than, than, yeah. than a thousand. So you, we really are looking at some really coarse grained second order statistics, which is no problem if, as long as you know that. Um, but it, it's not like, you know, sort of um, calcium imaging in, in small animal models where you can actually see the, the flashes of individual neurons, for example. You know, we're talking about something that is much more macroscopic in nature. And with, with fMRI, so the strength of the magnet uh, influences the spatial resolution. I think if anyone uh, viewing or listening has had an MRI done on them, it was probably done on a three Tesla strength magnet. I, I have a colleague at NIH, Avi Nath, who I did a podcast with on effects of HIV and COVID on the brain. And they have a 9.7 Tesla magnet at NIH now. And he said it's remarkable the, the images they're getting with that. So are there limits to, to the power of the, the magnet and, and, and the resolution? Yeah, there must be. Every time you say there's one, somebody comes along with an even higher field strength. Um, but there must be, yeah. So nine, nine point four. That, that that's pretty impressive. I can imagine you get some really beautiful pictures. Um, you know, yeah. sort of cortical mammal and, and the like. Um, uh, but the, you know, the higher the field strength, uh, the more you run into distortion problems, and at some point you can actually start to stimulate the thing you're trying to image. Uh, 
So if you're, oh, so, uh, so, so the whole, yeah. the whole point of, of, of this kind of imaging is to um, um, sort of align magnetic spins um, and then watch them relax in a way that um, leverages the fact that their relaxation occurs at, you know, at different rates in different, uh, in different contexts, um, you know, to say blood oxygenation or in one part of the neuropil or in one part of the vasculature. Uh, <clears throat> but in aligning the spins, you are actually pumping in a lot of electromagnetic energy that can actually- Yeah, know, that's a good- Neuro That's a good point. Now that made me think of a, a method called uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where magnetic field kind of focus ones are used to either activate or inhibit different brain regions. Yeah, exactly the same principle. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's but, that's a good point. By by looking at it, you're affecting it. <laughs> yes, very Heinzbergian. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, and there are other technical, you know, you get some beautiful data, but of course these these um, the artifacts that are, are induced by um, say simple things like head motion or various homogeneities in the in the magnetic field become much more pronounced at very high field. So it's it's really a sort of power users game at the moment to go to uh -huh. these exquisitely high fields. You have to have lots of uh, MRI physicists, lots of kit, uh, uh, a really good site to you know, stop interference, and also a lot of post-processing in order to resolve it and to get at the rich information in there in a way that's not... Okay, not so, so maybe um, the magnet strength increasing it is a, can be of great value for, for looking at morphology, you know, brain structure, because presumably that's not going to change very quickly, but activity could be affected. Now let's... Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I, well I, I just qualify that. I mean, there's a lot of interest in getting down to um, the sort of the microcircuitry level or scale of message passing yeah. in particular. You know, why is it that the cortex is divided into, say, six layers? You, you know, have a granular layer in the middle. Uh, and superficial and deep layers divided into six layers. And they're all occupied by particular cell types that have a well-defined and systematic inter and intralaminar connectivity. Why is that? And why is that structure replicated in the form of a canonical microcircuit through many, many parts of the brain? So a lot of the questions uh, you know, um, of the functional integration sort um, that people are asking are well what's the distinction between forward and backward connections and the answer is simply the lamina specificity of the forward and backward connections well, that means that the you know the functional roles uh, and one um, nice framework to understand that a distinction of functional roles would be predicted coding the difference between forward and backward in that context being the difference between predictions which are sent down the hierarchy towards the sens sensory information and prediction errors that are sent back up to improve the predictions. So that asymmetry in the message passing um, um, has to be at some, in some way reflected in the specificity of the responses in different layers. And of course, if you can go to 70 or 9.4 uh, Tesla, you've now got an opportunity to resolve and actually look at the activation in different layers. So oh. that's a, that's quite an exciting and current yes. field of research. Yes. Um, so, but you know, just to um, sort of endorse endorse your point, you, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, the exquisite anatomical detail you get um, is really quite exciting. And furthermore, by tweaking and having a series of uh, sequences, you can extract sort of different perspective, different mixtures, and reconstitute different sort of um, measures or parameters that characterize this part of our anatomical tissue, uh, sometimes known as multi-parameter mapping, that gives you a new wave kind of histology and an in vivo histology. So you can now use these really high field MRIs to do the kind of neuropathology that people would have to wait until the, the, um, the subject died yes, to do properly. Yes. So th yeah, these are really yeah. exciting yeah. Yeah, opportunities, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, 
so I, I put in, uh, I went on the PubMed and I put um, active inference in quotation marks. I searched for that. I went to the oldest article, which is your first article in uh, PLOS One uh, that I could find anyway. Reinforcement learning or active inference, question mark. And um, l let me, if you can indulge me for a second, uh, I wanna just kind of, I'm gonna read the abstract. It's, it's not real long and I think it, it's very well written, concise and thought provoking. So here goes. This paper questions the need for reinforcement learning or control theory when optimizing behavior. We show that it's fairly simple to teach an agent complicated and adaptive behaviors using a free energy formulation of perception. In this formulation, agents, by agents you mean, say people, adjust their internal states and sampling of the environment to minimize their free energy. Such people learn causal structure in the environment and sample it in an adaptive and self-supervised fashion. This results in behavioral policies that reproduce those optimized by reinforcement learning and dynamic programming. Critically, we do not need to invoke the notion of reward, value, or utility. We illustrate these points by solving a benchmark problem in dynamic programming, namely mountain car problem. And I'll move ahead to the last sentence. The ensuing proof, proof of concept may be important because the free energy formulation furnishes a unified account of both action and perception and may speak to a reappraisal of the role of dopamine in the brain. Well, um, so I looked at the paper. My math is very poor. <laughs> yeah, my ba basic math is good, but you get beyond simple algebra and it's uh, bad. So I kind of get lost, I think, as a lot of people do, if they try to understand this in the math and, and you know, by understanding the math, because you have to have some math background to understand it. But I thought the abstract of that article kind of put it in, in terms the layman can understand. Do you want to, and, and since that time, uh, now, what, 13 years ago, you've done a lot more work on this and a lot more theoretical work, uh, trying to, to come up with essentially mathematical predictions of how the brain works and, 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 and testable, in, at least in many cases. So go ahead. Right. And and I and I should say Carl has many. There, you can go on YouTube, viewers or listeners, and also podcast Spotify. You'll find many of his interviews where they focus on this uh, active inference and um, free energy hypothesis, and a lot of artificial intelligence people are interested and so on. But let's try to keep it thinking about the brain and, and the neural circuits and how they're integrated and what we've talked about so far in, in our conversation. Right. Um, so that, that should be fairly easy, really, because um, you know, a lot of this notion, say, the predictive processing and the message passing in hierarchies, all of this is, if you like, one expression of active inference, which itself is an expression or an implementation or application of the free energy principle. So I'll try to quickly take you through the basic idea in relation to that abstract, which I've forgotten about. Uh, that was 13 years ago, good grief. Um, so, um, so, yeah, the, you will find there are two um, approaches to these ideas. Um, one from the point of view of a physicist, and you'll probably need to uh, like the maths and, and uh, that attends a physics explanation of self-organization um, and that would be the free energy account uh, and you know that is shamelessly um, um, mathematically in, in, in nature because you know that's where the, the story and the narrative unfolds yeah. it's just what would it be like if I existed 
with characteristic states, what dynamical properties um, and mathematical principles must attend my existence. And then it, you, know, you work your way to schemes that, that, that um, are, if you like, the same kind of um, schemes, self-organization, message passing, that you would get if you took a more brain-centric and uh, predictive coding-like approach or road, a more intuitive uh, uh, way of understanding. So the, the, both the, the maths physics part and the more biologically inspired predictive processing active inference um, roots converge upon the same point of understanding, which can be intuitive and doesn't need too much maths. So that, that's very simple. It's, it's just saying that, <clears throat> so, so that the, way, the, the way that we can describe behavior, and in particular sentient behavior, by which I mean behavior that is informed by some kind of sense making, is in terms of minimizing surprise. Um, another way of stating that is maximizing the likelihood of the outcomes that I sense, given I am the kind of thing that I am. So you, know, you can tell the story in terms of minimizing prediction error, minimizing surprise, or you can just invert everything and say, I'm gonna maximize model evidence, I'm gonna maximize predictability, uh, maximize um, or, or minimize my expected surprise and minimizing uncertainty, um, which translates into maximizing my information gain. They're, they're, they're just the same story, but, 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 uh, but inverted using negative quantities. So that story um, about um, the imperatives, the existential imperatives for any um, sentient behavior that has to be underwritten by belief updating in the brain and by neuronal message passing and the selection and planning of what to do next is just simply a statement that you can describe all sent behavior either as minimizing surprise or expected surprise or as maximizing um, what's called model evidence or the marginal likelihood or the expected uh, aspect of that, um, e.g. information gain. So it's all about minimizing uncertainty, basically. So technically, in information theory, expected surprise is called entropy and entropy is a way of understanding uncertainty so in one sense all i am doing in my sense making and in choosing the sensory samples or data actively some uh, choosing which to sample next you know, by moving my eyes or by palpating or by going to the right wikipedia page everything i do can be seen as an attempt to resolve uncertainty and resolve surprise in the sense that I am always going to try and solicit those sensory inputs that characterize me, the kind of sensory inputs that I expect to see. So coming back to that from uh, early um, PLOS paper, uh, the idea was all you need to do is to um, write down a little set of equations, specify a synthetic agent um, in a computer, equip it with a generative model or prior beliefs that it expects to sample these kinds of things, and then apply the free energy principle that is just uh, there to ensure that it updates its beliefs and acts in a way to minimize surprise. And in so doing, it ends up doing what it expects to do, which is climb mountains or you know, become rich or keep warm or whatever it is that characterizes that 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 kind of thing so that was the, the spirit of, of of that abstract that you know reward and loss and cost are just part and parcel of defining constraints on the kind of experiences or observations or outcomes that we actively work towards um, and that every outcome in every modality um, really uh, has is, is labeled with a, a kind of preference which just says that kind of state is not characteristic of me and I'm going to minimize my surprise by moving away from it 
this kind of state, this is the kind of outcome that I, I'm used to. This is what I expect, and I'm going to work towards. I'm going to work towards doing that. And then you can sort of commit to various uh, mathematical or biological process theories that do this surprise minimization. Well, most people's favorite at the moment um, is to read surprise as prediction error. So if I predict something and I get some observations, then the difference is the prediction error. And the bigger the prediction error, the bigger the surprise. So uh, predictive coding is a nice example of this surprise minimizing um, uh, formulation of, of, of uh, belief updating and, and action selection. And there's lots known about the architectures and the message processing and predictive coding, which actually fit very comfortably, certainly with early visual processing. And of course, we've been speaking about that. We've been speaking about top-down predictions and bottom-up prediction errors and you know, trying to minimize the prediction error and make it as small as possible. That's just surprise minimization or yeah. free energy minimization. Yeah. yeah. And this applies, you know, this my mind and yours too, I think, applies throughout the evolutionary history of life on Earth probably even single cell organisms to make decisions, right? Yep. They have different environmental inputs. And then, so that makes sense of, the, the, to me that this kind of principle is a fundamental feature of, of life. And you're also work, working with people uh, in artificial intelligence, or at least uh, educating them uh, on the, on how this can be applied to, to developing artificial intelligence. And in, in that, now I know why you use the word agent in that abstract, because in, instead of person or animal, it could, it could apply to a, to a computer. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. The, yeah. The word. Yes. Of course. The agent does come from sort of machine learning. You know, oh. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. I forgot about that. But that was written for, um, you know, for a machine learning audience. Oh, to that's sense. interesting because I, of course, I'm thinking about it. neuroscience. But yes. Well, I mean, it, it all inherits from neuroscience. But that that sort of, uh, um, if you like, sort of confrontational reinforcement learning, or trying to describe. Um, your behavior just in terms of one loss function as opposed to preferences of a space of outcomes was, um, you know, was, was a message for that community. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the principles um, um, that we're talking about here um, should exactly, as you say, apply to all biotic self-organization, you know, in some elemental form. Yeah. So, you know, certainly chemotactic organisms or uh, phototropic organisms certainly make decisions because they act in a way that maintains their homeostasis. And what is a homeostasis? Is it's the minimization of a prediction error right. or minimizing surprising outcomes? It's. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking out here at our. We have a bunch of trees behind our house, and they're. Yeah, they're uh, they're maximizing their branching pattern maximizes. You know, the amount of light that can fall on the leaves, and there's this. Um, we could talk forever. I don't want to get way off on tangents, but now I'm thinking of fractals and and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, okay, Carl, I think this is a good <clears throat> place to end. I've enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I've learned a lot. I hope our listeners and viewers have too. Um, so uh, yeah, keep up the good work. I'll try to I, I retired a few years ago. That's why I'm doing this making podcasts now. I have time to do this kind of thing. And it's also good for me. I can keep my brain in the neuroscience field and learn a little bit more about areas I wasn't really up on that good. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, great talking to you. Uh, thanks a lot.